Just start from where we left off the way. So I was asking so you have you have said the signs the signs of mental illness. So how you know we know there are some different types of mental illness. So how do I know I have this type of this mental illness? So how do you know what type of mental illness you have? Is that was is that the question? Yes. So as much as I don't like to recommend that people Google their symptoms, I know that a lot of people, when they put symptoms into um, a search engine, it can be quite scary. But if you don't have a lot of knowledge about mental health, then it might be worth to kind of start looking into different things and just say mental health and kind of what symptoms you're having. Because sometimes with mental illness, you don't know that you're unwell until other people start noticing that you're unwell. So um, depression, for example, you can have very low mood, you can feel extremely tired, you can have thoughts of suicide that can come along with depression. Um, you just have that lack of motivation, there's lots of symptoms of depression. And then anxiety is when your system almost goes into this constant state of fear or, and you know, if, you, if you're scared and your body goes into this like fight or flight, like this need to either escape or to protect yourself, that's kind of what anxiety feels like, is that the, there can be like this constant feeling like something could go wrong but nothing is wrong. So that's kind of what anxiety can feel like. But there's other illnesses such as schizophrenia, where a person can start hearing things or seeing things that no one else can see or hear, which of course, there's a huge cultural component to that because some cultures believe regarding like spirits and like messages that we can receive. So it's very dependent on what your beliefs are and whether your family is concerned about you because sometimes it's important just to kind of touch base with loved ones. Um, but there's also bipolar mood disorder. It's a combination of depression or you could get into a state of something called mania in which then you can be over the top energy. So you like can stop sleeping. You could be making some impulsive or bizarre decisions, acting really out of character. And that's one that usually family members are just like, what is going on? But that could be also some signs. But overall, the biggest thing is if you're feeling different in your body, if you're feeling that something just doesn't feel right and you're curious, it just helps to go on any search engine, look up mental health, and then just kind of start looking into something that some of your experiences, just if you can have a few answers. So at least if you go to see a physician or a psychiatrist or whoever can help you, um, then at least you have a different ideas of what could be possibly going on. Yeah. So let's assume that I went to a search engine and I got my illness maybe to be anxiety or depression. No, mm -hmm. there is... There's this stigma that comes after that, you know, I have to go and tell my yes. parents or the people I inform. Now there's the society that comes. So there'll be like a stigma, like people like, maybe here in Africa, it's just like people say like, you're crazy. Mental mm -hmm. illness is not kind of that. It's not talked about here. Look. So, how do I deal with the stigma that comes after identifying my illness? So everyone is welcome to disclose as much as they want, right? So there's lots of people he, even here in Canada who are extremely embarrassed about having issues with their mental health. So if you feel it will be helpful to talk with your family and friends about your mental health, then that's amazing. But of course, that can come with stigma. Like you're saying, some people will not understand or there's such a mentality still that people can just get over it. Like, oh, you're sad, great. But things, it's far more, 
than feeling sad or feeling just a little overwhelmed. It's so much deeper than that. But when it comes to stigma, if you're finding that talking with others is more stressful and you feel, feel like it'll be more detrimental to your health, if there is any way that you could connect with youth groups or other um, like online forums and different groups that are maybe not even in your own country that you can be able to message with to kind of have like a discussion or an open discussion about what kind of things you're experiencing. Or the other thing is too, just reading people's posts about it, just so that you can feel a little bit of, um, a little less alone so that you know that other people are going through similar things. The only thing with that is, is that you then have to make sure if you don't want anyone to see what you've been searching, then you'd have to just delete your internet history if you're worried that other people are going to come across what you were looking at. Now, you've identified your illness, you've got your, you've overcame the stigma that comes with it. Now, where do I go? Where do I go to seek help? If you believe that you have a mental illness, where should you go? Yes. So, Every country is definitely different. In Canada, most people go to their family doctor. Um, but if, if you know of a specific place in your country, so like we also have community mental health buildings and people can call crisis lines. Um, there's also phone numbers that people can call just to ask questions about their health too. But it's all very dependent on where you live. So I'm not really sure how to answer that question like super broadly. It's basically if you were to look into what services were available because certain places might only just have a mental health hospital. I'm not too sure. I'd like to say like maybe here it's maybe you see the cancer house or maybe some doctors. Pardon, we cut out there. Yeah, I'm saying yeah, maybe you talk to maybe counselors or maybe mm -hmm. some, but yeah, yeah, counselors are amazing. I'm doing my master of arts in counseling psychology right now, so by 2022, I will be a, a registered counselor. But yeah, it, it, if there are counselors in your community or your area. Um, whether you can talk with them via phone or online, because that's the one beautiful thing about COVID is a lot of counselors now are available through Zoom, actually. So there's lots of different things for people to reach out for help um, if it's affordable, of course, because sometimes if you don't have the financial means, sometimes counselors can be a little costly. But if you have good health care coverage in your country, if you're able to go to a physician, then they might be able to suggest a medication might help or, or a treatment program that could be of help, like group therapy or something as well. Yeah, no, that, that will be it. So maybe for those people without the finances, they can go maybe to online or some groups out there. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I've seen some people yeah. who offer like free services. Yeah, it can unfortunately become quite expensive dependent on um, more countries are recognizing the need to help people with their mental health because it's costing hundreds of thousands to even billions of dollars per year of people being off work and unable to work because of their poor mental health. So countries if they actually invested in people's well-being they would be saving money it, it's it's far more affordable to treat everyone and help everyone than it is to pay for people who are unable to take care of themselves because they're so sick I, uh, that's really true. Well, now we are we just have the knowledge about the places we can go. So you, can you illustrate more about the mental health professionals and maybe some some different, yeah, maybe with some different types of professions in the mental health? 
For sure. So um, as I as mentioned before, I do nursing. So I specifically work mental health nursing. So there are nurses. Um, and sometimes they work in hospitals and some nurses actually work in a community setting where they can follow up with people even at their homes or something like that. There's also crisis professionals. So that can be someone you talk to over the phone who can help you when you're in crisis. Um, but there's also certain communities who have crisis workers who will do touch bases at a person's house as well. In the city that I'm in and a few other cities in Canada, our police station actually has a psychiatric nurse as well. And so if someone calls 911 and is concerned about someone's mental health and their safety, so if they think they're maybe suicidal or experiencing psychosis, then the mental health nurse and police officer will go to that person's home to do a wellness check to see if they're okay. But there's also psychiatrists who are typically um, work in hospital, but if they also work in the community, they're more medication based. So they do more of the medication prescriptions. While psychologists are also another form of physician who does more of the assessments, counseling, um, some of more the intensive therapy. And then there's counselors, which are also called psychotherapists or therapists. Um, but they're all just kind of under a broader scope and they're trying to kind of find the right definitions and terminology for how to define counselors and stuff. Even in Canada, they were counselors are unregulated in most places in Canada. So unfortunately, there's a lot of people who take advantage of the system. But um, luckily, we're, we're getting on it and slowly but surely becoming regulated in our country. Yeah. Question that first can mental illness be prevented? Yes, absolutely. Mental illness can be prevented. Not in every single case. So um, they're doing genetic studies, and this is still very far in the future, but they are doing genetic studies in which they believe that they're going to actually be able to pinpoint whether a person will have a mental illness. And that can be any mental illness on the whole spectrum of mental illness. Um, just based on genetics, which would be really cool. So that we'd be able to find preventative things for people to avoid it getting to a point of like complete disability. But that's a whole tangent. <laughs> but yes, mental health, if you can find ways to treat your mental health in a way that you want to improve your life and be able to, um, I'm trying to think of the right wording, but there are things such as taking a step back, emotionally processing any of the things that kind of come forward that are stressful, doing things that are self-care related so that you're actually taking time for yourself to ensure that your needs are being met, whatever those needs are. So those are the biggest prevention pieces. Also, if you've sensed that things are getting really overwhelming is finding ways to prioritize and set boundaries as to what you can and cannot do so that you don't get burnt out, so that you don't get to a point where your body and your mind's like, I need to stop versus I can step back so that I don't have to have to stop because I'm too unwell. Yeah, so to summarize that, so what can you say that? What, but, what can one do? Make sure you're mentally healthy. So I would say the biggest things are um, self-care, which are can be a variety of different things. So when most people hear of the word self-care, they think, oh, you have like a bubble bath or it's very, it's a very generic phrase. Most people just think self-care is like light and fluffy doing like nice little things, but self-care is so much more meaningful than a lot of people can um, look at it. So if you're a person who needs socialization, if you're a social person and you've been kind of locked up in your home for a long time, a piece of self-care for you might be to connect with someone over video chat and just have a really good conversation with them if you feel that's going to be like a good social need for you or self-care if you need like physical self-care that can be going for a long walk on a like beautiful evening and being able to just like experience the fresh air do those kind of things 
but everybody's very different when it comes to their self care and what is meaningful for them. The other thing is actually processing difficult emotions. So there can be soup, like there's massive quantities of options for that as well. But if I name a few, you can journal about whatever is ex you're experiencing and that way you can get everything that's up here written out and organized. Another thing is letting yourself experience the emotion through like um, crying or laughing or whatever the emotion is and just letting yourself have like if you're angry, if you need to yell into a pillow or whatever it is, you just let that emotion actually flow through you. Uh, some other things are physical exercise as well. Physical exercise helps you process emotions, but those are just a few different things. But yeah, so not avoiding anything and just trying to actually take the time, even if it's just a little bit of time for yourself to just kind of um, detach from the chaos and focus on what your needs are in a moment. Yeah, we have like, you know, the people like, let's say, this will go to classes. The society will be going to classes. So there's those people that know a class who, who are having like, let's say, 12 hour job. They have no time for themselves. They're actually having mental illness, but they cannot even address it. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, yeah. Those people. So, you can do something for yourself as easy as just doing three deep breaths, which honestly, even if that means you have to go into the washroom, to close the door, and just take three deep breaths, that within itself is good for your mental health as well. Because and that only takes a few seconds, right? Like it doesn't take a long time to just take a few deep breaths. I understand the struggle of feeling like you just don't have any time. I truly don't have much time um, for myself, but I have to schedule in little bits of self-care for me. Otherwise my mental health would do very poorly because I'm just so busy. But if I don't process my emotions, I, I notice very quickly that I start to burn out. Like I feel very exhausted and I just feel, it, it makes it hard to enjoy anything if you're just completely just overwhelmed. If you're only doing stuff that you have to do all the time versus stuff that you kind of want to do. It's, it's hard, but you almost have to schedule a little bit of time for yourself. Even if that's just 15 minutes a day or even 15 minutes a week, that's, it's still a little bit of time for you. Yeah, so what about those people who disregard these small things? You know, yeah. About what, sorry? Yeah, people who disregard this, these small things like taking a breath, you know? Maybe the way you are raised or your priorities can't let you so you're constantly working so what what would you yeah like? so we may feel like we are constantly doing something which can be very true we our time can be really really um I'm trying to think our time can be jam-packed so we really feel like we literally have no additional time but some like for myself because my day is so busy I just wake up 15 minutes early every or earlier every day just so that I can do something good for myself but also if you have like a family like if you're a parent and you need some time for yourself if your kids get to see that you take those moments for you they're going to learn that as a behavior that they are supposed to take care of themselves sometimes as well. So it, it can trickle through generations on like how much we take care of ourselves because we can feel bad about taking care of ourselves sometimes too because we think that we should be able to just handle whatever comes our way. But there is nothing selfish 
about doing something that's good for you, especially if you're feeling like you're really overwhelmed, is almost you almost have to do something good for yourself because otherwise you won't be able to perform the way you want to perform because you're unwell because you're just feeling so burnt out. Yeah. yeah, that's 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 true. So there's there's this letter that I'd like you to tell us about. So about the psychiatric advanced directive. Um, a psychiatric advanced directive. I'm not sure I know actually much about that. Do you, is, is that what you guys, or what is that from where you're at? What is that definition? So, um, I actually did some research about it. Uh, a letter that you get from the psychiatrist about your disorders. Oh, okay. And does it give you like a treatment plan as to what you can do for yourself? So I guess the, the directive is you kind of take to the health doctors so that they can give you treatment, maybe about medication. Yeah, that's the idea I crossed from that research. So I thought, me, I've never had a bit yeah. Hi, I lost you there for a minute. I was saying the letter. Mm -hmm. The letter is like, like the, it's, it's actually, they have diagnosed you now, they know your, which illness you have. So they, they give you the letter so that you can go and get medication. Oh, that's cool. Yeah, ours are a little bit different in Canada. I just quickly Googled. Yeah. Um, and it's our advanced directives are basically saying that we have the ability to refuse care. And what they would prefer as their preference of care. But that's cool that there's one, there's ones um, there that are related to being able to seek treatment. That's actually, that's, kind of cool but yeah we would not need to um we wouldn't need a doctor's note to say that we need to be able to seek treatment here for sure but um, sometimes if you need time off work or time off school they will provide you with a, dis a note for disability just to be off for a certain period of time to attend to your health yeah I'll, I'll confirm that from my research I just quickly I just saw the the directive and came to my mind as something which was interesting. So how can how can family participate in treatment? So the best thing to be able to do is to support their loved ones with where they're at. So I'm trying to think the best way to explain for family and friends, but telling a person that they'll just get over it is the last thing that anyone ever needs to hear. So lots of times we think we might be being helpful by being like, oh, everything will be okay. Um, we'll make it through this. Those kind of moments are meant to be supportive, but we need to ask just the, your loved one, what can we do to help? Everybody is so different in what we need in the moment of us feeling unwell that it's just really helpful if you're a loved one who wants to help your friend or family member. It's just say, what is it that I can do to help? Is there anything I can do to help you? And whether that's helping them clean their home, because sometimes if you're feeling really unwell, you have zero ability to um, 
um, cleaning up your house, or if that means that you cook for your loved one or family or friends and, and bring them like, like nutrient based foods and different things like that. But it can also just be a listening ear and just not being judgmental with some of their experiences and just being like, oh, 